Welcome everyone. We are in bold territory as our guest today is a pioneer in journalism and is an expert analyst and sports guestin. She normally is the one conducting these interviews and has done so for decades. If you grew up watching sports, you may know that Leslie Visser is the only sportscaster, male or female, to have worked on the network broadcast of the Super Bowl, Olympics, World Series, NBA Finals, Triple Crown, World Figure Skating Championship, Men's Final Four, and the U.S. Open. She's in six Hall of Fames and travels the world for sports and news stories and by invitation to share her iconic story all around the world. We are excited for everyone watching and listening, whether you are a fan of Leslie's, like I've been my whole life, or new to her incredible story, to discover special insights. Leslie, thank you for joining us on Little Starlight. Oh, Andrea, there's a reason no one turns you down. And I think that your listeners, your viewers should know, you know, one thing I've always known about you, Andrea, you are chromosomally honest. Even I remember at Wimbledon's, you know, finding you, interviewing you, it was just impossible for you, you had to, of course, on a couple of occasions, you really bit your tongue. And I'd love to hear more about that because you're just not built that way. <laughs> well, thank you for that. But you've had a, a pretty special beginning as a child. At 11 years old, you want, you knew what you wanted to do in life and you were determined and you went to your mom and you told her that you wanted to be a sports writer. So if someone, if a child today, a girl, a boy went to their parents and said that, no big deal. It'd be like, they. there's so many examples, so many role models for them. But this is in 1964 and there weren't any, there were no female sports writers. But instead of your mom saying no, because she, you know, she didn't want to say, uh, I'm not going to let you do that because of protecting you or that she wanted to have her own goals thrust on you. Instead of saying no right there. She said to you, great, sometimes you have to cross when it says don't walk. That had to be so transformative for you. So how was that for you? And then what can you share for parents to do the same thing and be supportive when their young children come to them wanting to have aspirations and dreams and how can they fulfill those? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning my mom. Uh, my mother came from a dignified but lower middle class Irish family in the Berkshires in Massachusetts. My dad grew up in Amsterdam. They had very, very different lives. And uh, we moved a lot. And we were living then in Ohio, a little north of Cincinnati. And I was 10. My mom was a teacher. And she did. She said to me, Leslie, what do you think? You know, what do you think you want to do when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a sports writer. And at that time, in the early mid-60s, I don't know, recall what your mom did, but most women then, their choices were so limited. They, they could be uh, you know, a teacher, a nurse, uh, a domestic, uh, a secretary, but you know, sports writing, I mean, that was just unheard of. But I was one of those kids, um, you know, not unlike kids who love music or poetry or you love tennis. I just happened to love sports. I, I watched it all. I, my brother and I, I'm a native Bostonian, and we would count our pennies to see, you know, taking the bus to Fenway Park at eight years old. I learned to score the double play six to four to three, which is the best play in baseball. <laughs> and uh, my mom, we were then, we had moved to Cincinnati. And when she said to me, what do you think you want to do when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a sports writer. She didn't say, and this is for all parents, she didn't say, oh, you can't do that. Girls don't do that. No, these are more typical choices that you're going to have. She said, as you quoted, that's great. Sometimes you have to cross when it says don't walk. That's just so incredible. I mean, and, and like you said, yes, in, in a way. Now, sometimes parents say things like that and, and kids don't necessarily go forth and, and live that. They're so used to hearing, you know, the opposite of that. So when parents hear something um, really profound that they think, okay, because children sometimes change their interests. When I was a little kid, I wanted to help, you know, animals. I wanted to help people. I just, I wanted to help something. Tennis wasn't really on my um, radar. So when you started that first step, how long did it take? Did you start like writing notes already or did you do something right away? <laughs> did it take a while? <laughs> you know, for you, help is the key word. Maybe you didn't know where or how, but help for you is who you are. And I was really meant to be a journalist. I was meant to be a writer. And uh, I read, you know, I'd run to the mailbox on Thursdays. That's when Sports Illustrated arrived. I, 
you know, I'd listen to games on the radio. I'd watch them uh, as a child in Boston, the great Kirk Gowdy, who all your parents would know if they follow sports. Uh, I would listen to him call Red Sox games on my little transistor, you know, underneath the blankets. So I was really, I had a passion, which um, not all kids have. So I, I look at that. I was blessed that I, I love competition. I always say this about it and you guys have lived it that um, the great thing about sports, it's the ultimate meritocracy. It doesn't matter how much money your father has. It doesn't matter where your mother went to college. You know, do you hit the jumper? Do you sink the putt? Do you hit it up the line for the, a winner? You know, it's, it's you. And I love that about it because coming into it, I mean, for maybe the first 10 years, I worked with pretty much 100% men. And there were no ladies' rooms because there hadn't been any women. So it was, uh, but the meritocracy of me being able to write and to cover a game, it was there for me. And I was looking at people who were doing exactly what I believed in. That's awesome. It's, it's true. Sports has that <laughs> great equalizer ability. Um, if you have a passion for it, it's an immediate connection and, and shows so much. Your dad has a, a wonderful gratitude story, which I want to end with, that he helped you learn gratitude. But I wanted to do something that's more current, because from what I've heard, when someone asks you, um, what's your favorite place? And you're like Lambeau Field in January. So you must be feeling it. Do you think Lambeau is going to be a little different without Aaron Rodgers? There's going to be a big change over there. Well, you know, it's interesting. I was um, a child who loved the Packers, never, ever thought. I mean, as I said, my family had no connection to sports at all. I remember my dad used to embarrass me. We'd go skating on frozen ponds and he'd do that Dutch thing, you know, with one arm behind the back and a pipe. It was like mortifying. But um, I, there is something, actually, you'll, I think you'll get a kick out of this. My three favorite venues in the world all are the same color. They're that same sort of rusted green, which Lambeau Field is, Fenway Park is, and Wimbledon is. So I think I must have just been drawn to tradition. And I think it comes from they were all old brass places, you know, 100 years ago, more than that, 120 years ago. And then as they aged, they took on that patina. But uh, Lambeau Field is, it's the only pro team that's in just a tiny town and the people there have lived it for more than a hundred years. It's a privilege. It's a privilege to go to Fenway, privilege to go to, to, um, Fenway, or to Wimbledon. And so, uh, yeah, I, I used to, you know, it'd be freezing, it'd be January. And I tried everything as the sideline reporter. Um, I remember once I tried battery operated socks cause you're out there, you know, <laughs> and it's freezing. And I worked with the great John Madden. I got to ride his bus with him for years. And so the batteries, I'm clumping around Lambeau Field and the batteries went dead in like the second quarter. And I think on the air, John Madden said, that's the most pathetic thing I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> so it, um, I just feel probably like you, you know, blessed that, that these opportunities take us around the world. And I know, and if you haven't shared it lately, share it again, because now I'm talking to you. We both have met Nelson Mandela, mine for five seconds. You actually got to know him. But of course, he was the man who said that sport has the power to change the world, which we've both seen and experienced. But will you share how you came to know him? Oh, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. It was um, one of the, I mean, it's strange because when I was in high school, I would travel to these tournaments around the world because I turned pro at 14. So in our school history books, we're reading about Nelson Mandela, we're reading about what was going on in Africa. And I happened to be in a junior tournament there the first time when I was 13. Very strange circumstances for me because I, I would see that, I mean, the, they had separate bathrooms. So the black people had to go in a separate bathroom than the white people. There was separate stadiums, there was uh, seating, there's separate places they could eat and separate water fountains. I mean, it was it was something pretty shocking. So when I went back to school and people were reading out about it in a book, they kind of were, ah, no big deal. You know, you just read it. But I had seen it and it was, it was, it was haunt, it was a bit haunting to see that and and so unfair. And so I never thought that someone as his stature I would ever come across. And so I was um, running children's cancer programs and <laughs> it's in a circumstance where I was actually getting 
my hair done, like just, you know, you're getting your hair cut. <laughs> and so I was reading a book, it was before cell phones, all that. And, and, um, or, or at least the way we use cell phones now. And I received a call and they said, secret service is on the way to your property. And I went, okay, well, what's up? I didn't even like look panicked or sound panic. And they said, well, Nelson Mandela is coming to visit you. And I went, okay, I'll be right over. <laughs> so my hair was soaking wet. And I had to go. She only got like one side cut. I just ran over what I was in. And they were doing a walkabout to check security. And I, and so it's like, okay. And we had, um, we've always helped children with cancer, but we also, Little Star Foundation, we also help children in need. So we had helped build an orphanage in Africa. And he had heard about the work that I had been doing. He heard about the facility that we had built. He, he, um, he had a compassion for what we were doing and an excitement to see, you know, what, what we were doing. And so he came and it was, it was this long visit in the sense of he, he walked in and there's, um, you know, people have, everyone has a certain presence. They have a certain way they carry their energy. And, and you and I had spoke about this before he, there was no, um, air about him. It was no, I am Nelson Mandela and you're just this person. It was, he was just grateful to meet anyone, see anyone. And I was so excited. I, I we didn't have kids at, that particular time it was one of the days off in between sessions because you have to clean and you know do all that and then get to the next one but everyone that was in the building it didn't matter if someone was like you know helping clean their toilet so I called the group over and the staff and and he was so generous with his time and we rode in the elevator together and went in each room together I gave him a private tour and he asked very interesting questions about how we had kids like he actually asked um things that were insightful, things that were curious. And, and then he said some really kind things that I've, some I've never shared publicly um, just because it's like, you know, I mean, how do you open a conversation? Nelson Mandela said these were really cool. I just didn't. <laughs> so I wrote them down in my little journal, but every once in a while I share, but um, in my situation, it, it wasn't like you travel the world and speak to these people and you get information that educates and informs the world it's a completely different scenario Mine was like I might have done a couple of good things across the time and he heard about it and he was like hey you know and wanted to thank me for that yours is like a whole different world of of introduction no, but you know a, a couple of things from from that story you can't tell enough Andrew you cannot tell that story of meeting Nelson Mandela enough because it hits people it resonates with people and Two things. One, you were about in my 45 years of covering sports. I think you were the most chill athlete I ever covered. So uh, <laughs> the fact that you say you ran out with wet hair <laughs> and you were just shows just how exciting it was. I mean, we did talk about uh, I've had a few occasions that you felt the aura of the man, despite the man's modesty. And certainly Nelson Mandela had that uh, Muhammad Ali had that. But, um, you know, you, telling your story made me think um, neither of us has experienced anything of the Black Lives Matter, but I've had the privilege in my career of going uh, all the way back. I knew Jim Brown. I knew Bill Russell very well. I knew um, Kareem. I know LeBron a little. I met Kaepernick. So I've known the chain of athlete activists, especially in the realm of the African American. And uh, I remember uh, I was the first and only woman to cover the NFL as a beat in uh, the Boston Globe, I wrote for the Globe, and it was in the uh, early mid 70s. And uh, the best players to me were the black players. And, you know, it was like really like a zoo, right? I, as I said, they didn't have bathrooms. My credentials said no women or children in the press box. I was trying to, you know, do all this Ginger Rogers dancing backwards thing all the time. And one time I asked one of the players, one of the African-American players, why are you guys so great to me? And he looked at me and he said, because we know what it's like to be the only one. Wow. So that it, it is interesting, the respect that they had for you and knowing. And the other thing I will say this, you know, your craft, you know, your work, you research, you study. I mean, this is like, for us, this isn't 
our realm. You know, we wanted to bring inspirational stories to the world. So it's like for the first five episodes, I don't know if I hit the right buttons. (laughs) You know, I still don't know if I'm doing that correctly. But the way you present yourself, everyone knows this isn't someone that they had to put in. You were as good, if not better than a male counterpart. And so I think that was also respected and, and, and you know that you had to work so much harder, but, um, but I'll tell you an interesting story. Yeah. It's, um, you know, it was men who were willing to take a chance on me at every turn. I mean, uh, the Boston globe, you know, they sent me to Wimbledon. They sent me the final four, the super bowl, the world series, uh, Olympics, uh, I get to CBS and I was again, the only woman reporter at CBS at that time. And they, they sent me the fall of the Berlin wall. I mean, they trusted that uh, I would have a sincere connection with whatever I was covering, but it's, um, I think like you're an honorable role model. I, I, I'm sure along the way, as you were learning to do all this, you said, okay, I want to represent my name. I want to represent women. I want to represent cancer survivors. Like I want to make sure that I am a representative of all that. And I've always said this over the years that in my business, uh, there are two kinds of women who do sports. There are women who love sports and end up in television. And then there are women who just wanna be on television and they end up in sports. And I think the viewer can tell that. And I'm sure when you connect with people like Nelson Mandela and Kevin Costner and just the range of people, um, just for your viewers or listeners. It is interesting. And that's that's something that when I did speak with Nelson Mandela and we spent some time alone and it, it it's true. I just, I held that sacred to what he shared. And it was also complimentary. I, when you talk about representation and we'll get to Tedra in the next, but when you talk to representation, I never thought of, I represent anything other than I felt a connection to the people who were receiving something. And so that was more it than me, because now you, we see a lot of that out there in the world that people are branding and they're doing this and that. I just, I never really fit in a mold. I don't think I still fit in a mold. Um, I will say I was criticized by a lot of people for starting a children's cancer foundation. I was, um, so it, it wasn't as if, oh, look, isn't she great? And I did think when Nelson Mandela came, I thought, well, that's so interesting because someone, and it was the first time I ever thought of that story. Someone in tennis, when I was injured, had told me after I walked off the center court at the French Open, that it was a reporter. And he said to me, I would never amount to anything ever again now that I couldn't play tennis. And I never, I just, I felt sorry for him. Wait I actually, seriously? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why yes. though? Because you had, I just, why? it was, you I know, mean, you, were, you were a tough 80s. competitor. I mean, that was, uh, but it's, um, it's like every, I think what anyone goes through in life, um, people are, they have their experiences and they only know how to represent from their experiences. And I think all of us here and what I give the benefit to our audiences is that they have greater experiences than what they have been able to have the privilege to be shared. And well, I let think- let me ask you this. When, um, <laughs> sorry, I know I can't the reporter in me. Um, you, know, you asked about uh, the Packers after um, Aaron Rodgers, which they were blessed, of course. Um, they had Brett Favre right before. Right. So, so maybe Jordan Love, I don't know, maybe he will be. Um, I mean, we never thought there'd be another Brett Favre. And then there came Aaron Rodgers. You know, we never thought- there, well, for me, never thought there'd be another Bill Russell, then came Michael Jordan, and then came LeBron, nice. Alcaraz on the men's side. I like where they they think a point through, they're creating a point. I, I, I very much enjoy this era right now. And, you know, I, I wanted to always ask you, um, when you played Chris, you beat her, very few people did, but you did. Uh, did you think she, she is as mentally tough as I am? Or, or what was that experience? I, the first time I defeated her was in Oakland and my sister was at Stanford University at the time. And so I was just excited that my sister could bring her friends and she could come watch. And so for me, I was like, okay, might as well, you know, win this tournament because she'll have so much fun watching. And so I beat I defeated Chris in the finals and it didn't really affect me that much. It was like, okay, cool. I, I defeated but her. Did like, you okay. within the point say, okay, she is mentally she is more locked in than most people I play because yeah, it wasn't she def- 
Yeah, she definitely was more so than most people. When I played her at the French, I'm pretty strong willed. I pretty much have a mental fortitude that I know if God calls me to something, it's going to get done. It's just going to get done. And if not, then that's okay too. Um, but she was definitely smarter in, in many ways and, and maybe played a few more shots each point that you had to do extra. Um, but I, I would say... Um, you know, she didn't have the strength of Martina or she didn't have the quickness of... Right. She um, outwilled people and out, you know, outpatient them. And and for me, it just was that, different. That wasn't you know, it was, yeah, yeah, it wasn't a difficult thing for yeah. me to yeah. come against that. Um, yeah. I think for maybe some other players, but I mean, you watch Carlos and he loves tennis, whether he's winning a point or losing, he's so acrobatic in what he does. It's a whole different world. I think um, men's and women's tennis now people are pretty excited about. And I, it I is think- that same meritocracy that I was talking about. Like, it's very difficult to be in the NBA and be anywhere under 6'2". It's just, I mean, maybe there are two of them. But, you know, you can be Alcaraz's size, you can be Sitsipas, you can be Sabalenka's size. So I, I do like that actually tennis, to me right now, is having a great democracy. Absolutely, absolutely. Which will bring our next tennis player that's in this podcast, Adriana. is like ready. And she she was excited. She knew that I had known you since a kid, but and that we just revisited again. Um, but she was super excited too because sports, like you said, for for women, is has been a different entry, um, a different opportunities. And so I'm excited to hear um, Adriana's. Well, you know, I, input. I'd like. Yeah, join us, Adriana. Hi, but, hi, I was going to say that it's been interesting to watch the history of women's sports in this country. I've kind of lived a lot of it. And it always was that we, as a nation, embraced the individual sport. We embraced figure skating. We embraced what, you know, even before Mary Lou Retton and Coma Nietzsche, we, we embraced gymnastics and we embraced uh, golf. Well, no, yeah, well, yeah, it did. golf had its time, but tennis. Uh, figure skating were really the big sports in this country. And now, I don't know if you feel it, but I feel we're coming around to, uh, well, college women's basketball, certainly soccer. So I think the country's really in an exciting point right now. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing. First of all, it is wonderful to be on the podcast with you. Thank you for being with us. I have very much respect for where you come from. Thank you. I watched your interviews and you are truly a master at your craft. It is so obvious. It shows how much passion, time and effort, knowledge you put into it. And you're so very respected. And yet with such an amazing career, with so many accomplishments and awards, you remain humble. It is truly inspiring. Oh, Um, thank you. I've, I've been humbled on many occasions. Matter of fact, when I went from print to television, I knew everything because I'd covered every single sport that CBS put on, but I I never had a chance to do anything locally. I went right from uh, nothing to the network. And this was before ESPN, there were only three networks. And I think it was the first time that I, maybe I interviewed Billie Jean or or somebody. I think the interviewing comes, I don't know if this is, comes into all of yours, obviously, Andrea knows what she's doing, but it's, it's, do you have a genuine curiosity, which I do. I, I never think any story is too big or too small. Why do you think you fell in love with sports in general and sports casting, sports writing? What was it about sports that drew you to? Yeah, I, um, I loved language. Um, my mother was an English teacher, so we had books all the time. And uh, I loved, I just loved sports. It was something for me. I mean, I was terrible. I wasn't going to ever be ballet. You know, I grew up around guys playing touch football in the backyard and you could imagine who you were or baseball. And my family wasn't wealthy enough for tennis or um, it just, and there were no, you know, camps or coaches, anything like that. But uh, I felt that, wow, this is for me. You know, you can put something on like like your beautiful sweater and say, yeah, this is good. This feels good. And sports just felt right to me. And having a real love of learning. Um, my mom actually raised um, my family on poetry, which is interesting because poetry has a rhythm to it. Mm-hmm. I must go down to the seas again, to the lonely sea in the sky. And all I ask is a tall ship and a star to steer her by. So I think I learned to write with that rhythm. 
So I, it, it served me, yeah. That's beautiful. Your accomplishments are truly, truly remarkable and inspiring. What are some of the traits you have and have developed over time to become successful at your craft? Oh, that is a great question. Uh, I think you need three elements to succeed in this business. I don't, maybe in all businesses, but certainly in this one, uh, you need passion. You know, I, I tell young women, if you don't love it, don't do it because it'll come out somewhere, you know, someone else is making more money or someone else got an assignment that you thought you deserved. So I think you need passion. Um, I think you need knowledge in anything, you know, knowledge is unassailable and it, uh, it gives you confidence when, when you have knowledge mm -hmm. and you also have to have stamina because in most things in life, that Ferris wheel is going to come down. <laughs> yes, it goes up. I mean, Andrea got such a lofty you know ranking in her career but um most players get older and it comes down and uh so you need to say i can count on myself i can pick myself up um i understand i'm going to have some scar tissue which i have plenty of it after all these years and say but okay on balance it's you know it's been pretty good wow what are some of the most challenging aspects when you entered such a male dominant territory and how did you overcome them? You know, I sort of look back now and I, I don't even know how it was <laughs> no bathroom. They had no provisions for equality. The first five years I covered the NFL, I did all the interviews in the parking lot. And, um, you know, I had real embarrassing moments. Uh, legendary uh, athlete in this country, Terry Bradshaw, won four Super Bowls for the Pittsburgh Steelers, and I worked with him later on CBS, but I was 23 years old, first woman to cover the NFL, and um, I'm out in the parking lots down at Three Rivers where the Pittsburgh Steelers played, and so I had to wait, you know, when it's freezing, you're hopping from foot to foot, and he finally came out, and, you know, players, they're, they're done with the locker room, they just want to go home, but I was there, and I didn't I didn't want to complain to the Boston Globe because I didn't want them to say, oh, a girl can't do it. And I didn't want to complain to the NFL because I didn't want the NFL to say, well, a woman tried it. It couldn't happen. So I would just stand out there waiting. And when Terry Bradshaw came out after a big game, I went to ask him a question and he took my notepad and pen and he signed an autograph and ran away. And it was like I tried, you know, I said, wait a minute, I'm a reporter. And he said, ah, yeah, forget it. Thought it was like a groupie, you know. So um, what worked for me in all those circumstances was trying to make something lighthearted about it. I still have friendships that have go back 40 years. Matter of fact, next Sunday night, is it? We're all going over to uh, Andrea Joyce, who was a fellow reporter. She's fabulous. And it'll be Billie Jean and Mary Carrillo and these people that just have been meaningful. And my girlfriends from CBS outside, inside the business. And it's been meaningful to me that um, I've made solid girlfriends and I've kept them for decades, which when I started wasn't always the case. It was kind of, it's you or me, but um, some of us found each other and we've kept it, which I, thank you for asking that. It's, um, it's very important to me now. Friendships, that's beautiful. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Leslie, for sharing. And now Karen is up next. And what about <laughs> how great your English is that I went to college. <laughs> yeah, but still, what do you I interview athletes all the time? Are you kidding? And but even when you said, uh, you know, maybe you could elaborate. Well, that's like when I interview Ivy League athletes. So <laughs> good on you, girl. Okay, so wait, I get to interrupt oh, on this one because Karen's be Karen's laughing. Karen's laughing. So we're we have an episode that's coming up that's just us because um, audiences are sending questions and everything. And so we talked about this part. Um, I, I met Adriana a long, um, a long time ago and I was getting ready to play the Wimbledon again. legends. Yes. You're going to hear this again. So I was getting ready to play the Wimbledon legends and I hadn't gone back to Wimbledon in mm. decades. Just, I was invited to all the grand slams, never played them. Just, I felt like I had done that and I didn't want to go back. And it was just, I was busy with foundation work. And, and so we help children with cancer and children in need in England and Wales and around the world. So I thought this will be great. I can get my expenses covered. I can get, get donate my, uh, my prize money from the legend. So um, I met Adriana and she, and I was hitting against a wall to practice from the world of legends. And so <laughs> she saw me and said, do you need someone to, to hit with? You want to go out? And cause it was late at night. I didn't want to bother what, anyone at, at night. And, and so we, um, you know, I just found out about her journey and, Every professional athlete 
has a story. They have a story of perseverance and tenacity and incredibleness. I, for me, I grew up watching the, the Olympians, the, the Olympics, where that was every four years. So you're basically doing this, not even for financial gain. Now it's a little better, but just for you to be able to represent your country at the Olympics, which is so extraordinary to me, those athletes. And so everyone has hardship along the way. And so Adriana was, she wasn't even sharing this as a hardship story. We're just sharing about our, our life growing up and tennis and training because we had that in common. And she, when you were talking about her English, she had told me that, you know, for her, she came over to the States, but she learned English while she was in school. She's, she ended up getting a, a double major, but she learned it from also watching TV. Like, yeah, so they, Karen, quite a Karen and I would have this conversation <laughs> and Karen, Karen Nasser, was it cartoons? Like, what was it? Was it Scooby-Doo? <laughs> like, how did you learn it? <laughs> and so to me, um, that is such, it shows when somebody wants to gain and get somewhere in life, that perseverance, that hard work, that determination. I was so impressed by that, that it's hard to get through college as it is. You know, it's not a difficult thing just to get through, but to be able to go and have to learn their language and get the degree in that language that is that is something pretty impressive <laughs> karen's up to up to now she's going to get her own questions asked to her <laughs> hi leslie it's a pleasure meeting you uh we heard a lot of good things about you from andrea <laughs> um thank you so, and by the way this is the best we got to steal this zoom background is this in your apartment it's beautiful. oh this is my my wall it's beautiful <laughs> it's like yeah, yeah. Okay, so next time you talk to me, I'm going to have Karen's background. <laughs> Thank you. At night, at night, she goes and works on it, puts yeah. little birds in it. And, and I wish it, I would be this artistic, but no, it's just a, uh, like a sticker. Beautiful. So it took it took uh, two people to do it, but. <laughs> it works. Um, Thank you. Um, so, Leslie, I know you said that you met Nelson Mandela. For I interviewed Francois Pinar who, um, did you see the movie Invictus ever? You should go find it. It's the story of, um, basically of Nelson Mandela. De um, Morgan Freeman plays um, Nelson Mandela and Matt Damon plays Francois Pinar. And it was the true story. As you know, Nelson Mandela was in Robben Island for 27 years in prison and he could touch either side of the cell and he didn't come out bitter, which always just astonished me that, um, he'd be in there and he never got bitter, but he came out and he embraced the all white South African rugby team, which was very famous, you know, the apartheid. And he, um, he, instead of being angry, he embraced them. They went on to win. And Francois Pinar was the captain of that team played by Matt Damon when you see Invictus, which you're really going to want to see a brilliant movie. And so Francois Pinar, I interviewed and now he just introduced, it was just an introduction to Nelson Mandela. But it was interesting that Francois Pinar, who grew up, you know, in an um, apartheid South Africa, that he named Nelson Mandela godfather of his children. So um, it just shows, you know, sport has the power to change the world. Oh, wow. That's awesome. So well, then I was going to ask this question uh, regarding Nelson Mandela. So from your quick interaction, this actually goes for you both, Leslie and Andrea. Uh, from the quick interaction you guys had with Nelson Mandela, um, what what would you what did you learn from him that can help anyone? I think Andrea really addressed it. Uh, humil <laughs> humility, really humility, and also the great Muhammad Ali was very much the same. Muhammad Ali, um, you know, was playful but modest. He understood that he was Muhammad Ali, who actually gave up his career to protest the war. And um, I have the privilege; I was named one of he named me one of the Muhammad Ali daughters of greatness, which was just insane, <laughs> you know, but he very much transformed. He was the most popular athlete in, in the history of the world, really, Muhammad Ali. And he had that same, he changed his name from Cassius Clay, became Muslim. And he had that same humility that um, he had an arrogance in the ring and an arrogance playfully, but as a human being, no one was greater than anyone, which... Um, I mean, Andrea is like our mother Teresa, don't you think? Seriously. Yes. I mean, I don't mean to be a jerk, but she, she kind of is. No, she kind of is. She has that oh, light. She is. You know, everybody's good. She looks for the goodness in people. But um, mm -hmm. I would say that it was 
definitely an aura of humility about him. What about you, Andrea? When it, it, it was so interesting because the depth of how he cared about people came across and, and his appreciation of what I was doing and, and wanted to make sure to support me in, in his words to continue on the work. And, and he, he basically said that this is not easy work. I know this isn't easy work. I've been watching you and, and it's not easy work. And he did say that it's, but it's important work. And so no matter the journey, you keep doing the journey. And so it was it, to hear someone go back. It's one thing to come out of something and rise forth and, and, you know, do better, but it's another thing. And, and this is what I'm always impressed with people when they can do something to give back while they're doing it. It's, you know, there's, there's so many athletes out there, there's entertainers, there's all kinds of people in the world. But when you look at how you grow up as a kid, you grow up with a teacher, you grow up with your parents, it, hopefully someone has, you know, parents to grow up with. But the the people that get the less um, amount of praise are usually the ones that do the most amount of work. And, you know, to guide someone through. And so when someone does finally get a platform, and they come back, and I, I, I mean, I was just a I don't even think people knew about what I was doing. Maybe a few people had found out. I know. Well, um, really? People did not know. Like, wouldn't you go up to Harlem and deal with kids? Yeah, no, I, I did, a, I did a, a lot of things, but I didn't go tell media. Never, about it. I didn't, never. Yes. Yeah, so I'm finding I just, this now. <laughs> <laughs> so, Heck, I would have so, won a Pulitzer. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's, that's the part of, you know, like even why we're all here or why someone's listening or watching it's, you know, what can we do with this? Can it help someone's life? Can it inspire? Can they laugh about it? Um, will, will it lift them up in their day? And because we're, we want to take our moment and give package it to give something to someone else. And that's, that's what I noticed so much about him where he could have just gone the book route or gone the PR route or gone the give me, give me route. And he didn't. You know, he he decided to take moments, small moments for people who were just doing their best without fanfare, just and saying thank you. And so to have him make that effort and make that journey and to say thank you is, um, you know, certainly something I, I will always remember. And that's why when people do their best and and know that that excellence can make a difference, um, like here and in, in, in closing this, um, what I wanted Wait, to I do. I want to tell. Adriana and Karen, because you and I talked about this, that um, Nelson Mandela recited a poem every single night before he went to sleep. And I want you guys to go find this poem because the totality of the meaning of it is, is so important. Uh, the movie is called Invictus, and that was a poem by a white Victorian poet, Henley. Yeah, his name was Henley. And the last stanza of the poem which Nelson Mandela for 27 years would recite to himself before he went to sleep is the best guide that I've ever heard. What I was going to say oh, sure. in closing was to ask you about that, because when we were at the Billie Jean King Cup and of course, you know, women's sports and tennis and in general for women, we all thank and congratulate Billie Jean on what she's done. But how I wanted to, to close this is you sharing that because we were sitting there and you recited this. And I was asking you, like, what are your words of wisdom or where, where um, do you come from on so much? And you recited this with such beauty and such eloquence. And I was like, this is who you are. And so I was going to ask you on closing this up, um, like in sharing how someone can be of their highest and best self. And to know, for those people to know that in time, like-minded people with a heart that is centered and a goodwill will find them too. How would you like to share that to our audiences? And then this is, um, so if you oh, wouldn't mind to share you. that yes. that stanza, that would be fantastic if you could. Yes, this is what Nelson Mandela would recite to uh, himself every night he was in prison for 27 years. And it always... Um, was meaningful to me because he chose the words of a white Victorian poet. Uh, the name of the poem is Invictus, written by Henley, and the last stanza of it is, uh, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul.
That's, oh, that's yeah. profound. That's something. So, and you, you said that, and I just, you felt the words and, and you don't, a person doesn't have to meet Nelson Mandela to know and feel those words. They can hear them from you and, and that can resonate in their life. And so, um, so thank you for this. This is, we could, we could talk for days on your many accomplishments <laughs> and amazingness and would love to. And, um, but I, you know, everyone has, has their days. I know you, you have a, a busy schedule, but I, I just want to thank you so much. It's, it's um, something where people, when they, when they wake up in the morning, if they know that someone cares about them in, in that way, and they can lift up their spirits or say their prayer, or say their words of wisdom, whatever that is. Um, and, and to feel like they're still, they can still be that ch child inside that little kid inside that had a dream. And they can think back to your story going, I, nobody's done this before. That's okay. Be the first, be the pioneer, you know, make it happen. You know, there, there'll always be someone that may question it, but there's always going to be someone that's going to support you in, in this world of over 8 billion people. There's people that they care about everyone out there. So we just want to make sure to send the love to all of our audience. And thank you so much, Leslie. This has been oh, so fun. Thanks. <laughs> you know, it's thank the work so that, much, oh no, to you, Adriana and Karen, and you know, the work you do, it's really important and it's life-changing and when you wake up in the morning, I know you're just built with gratitude, but people, people thank you. I mean, you, you really, very few people really change society, but you are, and you do. And that's why you attract people like Adriana and Karen. So thanks to all of you. Mm -hmm.